Thank you. Um, and look, thank you to the AIG to invite him and come along today. It's, it's great to do a technical presentation for a change. The last four or five years have been largely product marketing and financial. Uh, and I have this factor I call the glaze factor. So my record is 30 seconds or under 30 seconds to get a fund manager in Sydney to glaze over when I start talking about these metals. Now, please don't set a personal best for me today. I'm, I'm working on a theory that some of you will still be alive at the end of this presentation. And also, thank you to Dudley and to Richard. I basically wasn't going to do much on the markets for rare earths, and you guys have certainly confirmed that was a good thing to do. So just a quick snapshot of Alco. Basically, we're a multi-commodity company. We are totally focused in the Central West. Now, you, when you've got to understand when you're in New South Wales, the Central West means just over the Blue Mountains. So you might be hundreds of thousands of kilometres from the western part of the state, but they call it the Central West. So we adopt that philosophy. We operate in the Central West, even though we are a Perth-based company. Our office is about half a kilometre away. So we've been very much focused in the Central West region for probably 20 years. We developed the Peel Gold Mine down here. If I can get that to work, down here. Back in 96, ran that for about 10 years, a heat leach gold operation, basically used all the funds that we generate from that to pump it back into the region, build up our exploration database and our, our discoveries. And one of the things that came out of that was the discovery of Tommingley, just up the road from Peak Hill, and also Dubbo. And that's really what we've been focused on. We've got some other very good exploration projects, major porphyry copper gold system at Bedanga at the north end. Uh, we actually found the McPhillamy's deposit about... Uh, Ten years ago, joint ventured it to Newmont. It ended up being a two and a half million ounce gold deposit. Uh, it was ultimately sold to Regis, and I'm glad to see that Regis are now going to go ahead and develop it. And I can be perfectly frank and tell you, it broke my heart to sell that. You don't every day, not every day, you find a two and a half or three million ounce gold deposit. Uh, so when you sell it, but out of that we pocketed seventy million dollars. So you know we can't complain, and that really funded us into developing the Tommingley gold mine. And Tommingley, uh, it's been operating now for four years. It's a good cash flow generator. And I can boldly stand up and say that in the last financial year, we are the most profitable rare earth company in the world. So on to Dubbo Project. So there you can see it, about 400 kilometres northwest of Sydney in the magical central, central west. It's a great agricultural region. It's uh, mixed uh, cereals, um, cattle, sheep, very, very pro productive area but also some big mines. Cadia Operation of Newcrest is in the, in the bottom middle there. Uh, North Park's just in the middle left. And then off to the far left is the, uh, the, the uh, Cobo Operation. So it's a great area to operate in the sense of you've got this mixed environment, mixed personal, personnel people. And Dubbo is about 45,000 people, so it's a reasonable place to operate from. Coming down to, to the Dubbo project, it's a very large resource. And here we go, we're going to put the, the glaze test. Uh, zirconium, hafnium, Niobium, tantalum, yttrium and rare earth. And I'm doing the technically correct thing and keeping yttrium out of rare earths because it's not really a rare earth. But from here on forward, I'll incorporate it into the rare earth production. Um, the, the fine resource that we have would last for 80 years as an open pit at a million tonnes a year. So it's a substantial resource. And I will show you a bit more of the geology in a moment. And what have we achieved? In the last 15 years, we've developed a flow sheet from scratch. Uh, we've got a major... Uh, operation, a pilot plant operation at Anstow in, in Sydney. We've been operating that for, for eight years and it's proved the technical and economic viability of that flow sheet. It's also, what uh, Dudley's mentioned, enabled us to take substantial products around the world to end users and develop the relationship with those end users. We have all the land that we need. We actually run now a commercial farming operation, believe it or not. Um, we own, end up owning 3,500 hectares of land, of which about 500 or 600 are required for the operation. Uh, under New South Wales law, we had to put $1,000 into biodiversity offset, so we had to create new uh, remnant vegetation area, to recreate remnant vegetation area. And the other 2,000 hectares, we now have a very productive uh, mixed grazing, sheep and cattle grazing. So yes, I'm also a world authority on, on cattle, and I can tell you we're going into the Wagyu beef business at some stage in the future. All our land, I said water, power supplies, we have all state and federal approvals in place. And we have multiple deals and agreements in place on our products. We still need to put some serious, genuine, real off-take agreements in place. And that's what I've been working on very hard for the last couple of years. But lots of MOUs and lots of LOIs. And we have to convert those into reality. We did a, a DFS back in 2015. 
uh, in 2016, we did a feed study, front end engineering and design study, which reconfirmed all the numbers for the, for the DFS. And uh, out of that came a 30% detailed design. And I'll come back to a bit more about that in a moment. In two, at the end of 2016, yeah, we engaged Udatech, the large Finnish engineering group, to take what had been done both in the DFS and the uh, feed study and look at taking that through to an EPC a BFS, in other words, bankable standard uh, report. And I'm also going to show you, and I won't say too much about here, about the stage modular design that we've come up with that will help us accelerate the project into, develop, into, into operation, but also bring down the, the financial risk. And on that, we're working with Sumitomo at Sui Bank. They're our major financial advisors. So where are we? OK, let's put it on the map. So what you're looking at there in the geology, the purple area is the Lachlan origin, Cambr Cambrian to uh, Carboniferous, volcano sedimentary intrusive environment, uh, onlapped by the Great Artesian sediments, um, basin sediments of Cretaceous, Jurassic, coming in on, on from the north, and the Sydney basins, that dark green colour you can see down to the right hand side. The, the project area forms part of what's called the Eastern Australian Alkaline or Mesozoic Alkaline Complex. There are multiple uh, alkaline intrusive complexes and volcanic complexes dotted throughout the whole region, extending from Victoria uh, down into Tasmania, right up along the east coast. And I'm really, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to say that we're part of that. So in detail, so we come in, zoom into the site. You can see the expiration licence mark there. The yellowy colour and the sort of purpley brown colour, that material there, is all part of a Cretaceous or Jurassic aged uh, alkaline volcanic complex. So you've got alkaline basalts, uh, trachytes and similar alkaline volcanics and probably was a large volcanic complex maybe 20 to 50 kilometres across and what you're seeing today is just the remnants of that after erosion. You orca can also see how it sits in that Mesozoic embayment. We're not sure the significance of that. Um, we don't think it's a caldera, it doesn't look like a caldera, but it's some kind of an embayment structure. And the key things in there is there's what we call the Tungai deposit, which is the main economic resource. There's another one called the railway deposit, about three kilometres away. That's probably the same size, but half the grade. So year 160, uh, we can still be mining in the, in the area mining from the railway deposit. And in the middle is probably geologically the most interesting thing, which is what we call the Tungai Valley caldera. It's a small vent-like body, not mineralised. None of those other yellow units you can see have any elevated uh, rare metals or rare earths in them. So that's what it looks like in, in cartoon style. So there's the deposit at the top. It's about 800 metres, 900 metres east-west, about 600 metres north-south. You can see the drilling pattern. It's about a 50 metre square drilling pattern dotted throughout. The black dots are RC holes. The white circles are diamond holes basically to confirm the RC drilling. And we only bothered to drill the RC down to about 50 metres vertical depth. And the reason for that is that, that at that depth we have probably a 40 year open pit supply of ore. There was no point in drilling the deposit out. Uh, the core holes here basically were drilled to understand the geology a little bit better and look at the long term potential should we need to do it. And we have a technical term for that today. We call it a lava blob. It's very technical. Um, we think it came up a, a structure on the right hand side, extruded out into what were then pretty soft sediments, the, uh, the Cretaceous or Jurassic sediments, and has some remarkable features. It's got a lot of vesicles on the top, uh, but also remarkably uniform in its grade. Um, all of those holes, if we ever got a 5% variation on the grade of the deposit in any of those drill holes, we went straight to the laboratory and said, you've made a mistake uh, because we just don't get any grade variation. The only thing we do see is on the margin. You can see it there. There's a fine grain siliceous margin around the edge. It's probably a 10 metre wide zone where there is a lot of free quartz because the deposit doesn't have any quartz in it. Uh, it's just a siliceous contact effect. It's probably higher grade, but in terms of long term of mining, we won't mine it because that silica causes all sorts of problems in the flow sheet. So, sorry, just go back for a second. Basically on the right hand side at the top 
It is a trachyte, so it's a rock that's mainly composed of albite, K feldspar, and egerine. They make up really that's 95% of the rock. The ore minerals, you know, it's a eudiolite like mineral, it's not really eudiolite. Eudiolites are sodium, zirconium, hydrous silicate. It's not zircon, it's quite different to zircon. In our case, it obviously contains all of the zirconium, all of the hafnium, the yttrium, and all of the heavier earth. In partnership with the eudiolite, we've got natro niobite. It's a uh, niobium tantalum oxide. Very unusual mineral. I'd never heard of it before until it was identified. And we do have bastnazite. I think Richard referred to that as well. So all the light rare earths are tied up in the bastnazite. The most important thing about all of those three there is that they're all soluble in sulfuric acid, readily soluble in sulfuric acid. We don't have to do anything difficult to them. And I'll show you the flow sheet in a moment. Um, but that's what makes this project economic. You know, if it wasn't, if they were more refractory materials like, like uh, columbite or uh, zircon, we wouldn't have a project and we certainly wouldn't have a flow sheet like we've got. So there's the flow sheet cartoon. So in simple terms, it's a sulfuric acid whole of all leach. So we crush and grind the rock, we mix it with sulfuric acid, we heat it. This is an open kiln uh, setup. It's not, a, it's not an autoclave. That product that comes out of that is mixed with water. We CCD it, so we separate the solids from the liquids. And the liquids going forward fundamentally go through a solvent extraction circuit, which initially separates out the, uh, the zirconium, then the hafnium, I'll come back to hafnium, and then niobium, and then finally the rare earths come out in a, in a separate stream. So it's all basically standard technology. We've just put it all together in one flow sheet, and that's something you won't see anywhere else in the world, what's been done here. Out of that, we produce a suite of zirconium products at the top. Uh, ZBC is zirconium basic carbonate, the zirconia, which is an oxide, obviously. We talk about specialty zirconias. I'll come back at the end and talk about that. And now a hafnium oxide. And hafnium oxide, or hafnium, is a very close chemical relative to zirconium. It, anywhere else in the world, it is only separated as part of the nuclear uh, process, the nuclear cycle, where they produce nuclear-grade zirconium metal for reactors, and they have to reduce or have to take out all of the hafnium. So that's the only other process. And they're very sophisticated, expensive processed. What we've developed at, uh, at ANSTO is a solvent extraction flow sheet that now produces a 99% plus hafnium oxide. And you'll see a bit more about that in the markets in a moment. Because of our, we have a, a deal with Tribarker in, the, in Austria who basically want to market ferro-niobium on our behalf. And so we will produce a ferro-niobium product from our niobium concentrate off that flow sheet. And then on the rare earth, we will do a number of things. We'll separate out Cerium and lanthanum in the, in the, on the plant on site, largely because, as, as Richard and Dudley have already alluded to, they have minimal value today. We'll pull out the middle stream, neodymium, prosodium, down through to lutetium, and also a yttrium product. And the reason we pull out the se separate yttrium product is because that will go into these specialty zirconias up here. So we'll produce a thing called yttria stabilised zirconia. And I won't bore you with all of that right now, but it's an interesting product, and I'll show you at the end, I'll show you some material that we have on that. So, yeah, it, it looks complicated. Uh, it is reasonably complicated, but having run that pilot plant now for eight years, you know, technically, chemically, in an engineering sense, we have no issues. It's very capable and, and um, what's the word, robust flow sheets, I think it's the right word. So, product output at the top, chemical concentrate, so initially we'll produce that, that total rare earth concentrate, about 95% REOs of all the, all the, all the rare earths, the 6,000 tonnes, uh, 16,000 tonnes of zirconia, so you can see it's our, probably our major product. Hafnia, uh, which we talk about 50 tonnes there, we can actually produce probably 200 or 300 tonnes, and the reason that we only produce 50, 50 tonnes up front is because the current world to market, market is about 80 tonnes. So we have no desire to blow up the hafnium market. It's much better for us to put it in a shed and just quietly feed it out. But what is really interesting, and I'll come back and show you that in a moment, about where we see the hafnium market going. And then down the bottom, you've got about 2,000 tonnes of, of niobium in ferro-niobium. Total output's about 25,000 tonnes. So that material and those, those tonnages are all based on detail, 
mass balances off the, off the pilot plant. So we have detailed understanding of recirculating loads, uh, chemi chemical requirements, what we end up with. So a very, very good understanding and hence very, very good economics. So I mentioned that the rare earths, and so currently the, the rare earth con comes out. As I said before, we pull out lanthanum and serum at the top. If I can find that. Yep, up there. And they'll just get stored to start with. The yttrium, a thousand tonnes of yttria a year, that goes into our own storage and into our own system. And there's all the other different rare earths that we can produce down the right hand side. And again, Dudley and Richard have already alluded to the PRND. So we'll produce about 1,200, 1,300 tonnes of NDPR a year, or PRND, let's get the right way around. We also have markets for samarium, gadolinium, terbium dysprosium, again for the magnet industry, and right the way through the other five, the bottom right five, probably except thallium. We can't really, there is a use for it, uh, it's a very dangerous and toxic material, but at this stage nobody was prepared to buy it from us, so it's, it'll sit there for the time being. So going forward, now that plant that I showed you, that flow sheet, basically was a billion dollar plant, a billion dollars to build a million ton a year operating plant. It's a huge amount of money even for a company of alkane size given its cash flow and its, and its resources. We decided that we had to look at a better way. And about two years ago, talking to a number of engineering groups, came up with a modularised concept. And this really came out of the LNG industry. The LNG industry do produce uh, or do build trains, um, modularised plants. They build them up over time. And we thought we could break it up into four trains, or stage one and stage two, about quarter million tonnes each. And if you look at the little graph, not graph, the colour scheme at the bottom, so some of the components will go in up front at a million tonnes a year, some will go in at half a million tonnes a year, and some will go in at quarter million tonnes a year. So you can see how even in stage one or module or train one or two, we've mixed that up. And in doing that, we end up with a capital cost at around $480 million for the whole of train one. We may still, sorry, the whole of stage one, we may still build it in two trains. We may build train one, get it up and running, build train two, and then progressively work our way through. Stage two, the whole, the second part, uh, the cost of that comes in at about 360. Now, you add those two up and you don't get a billion dollars. And the reason you don't get a billion dollars is because the modular design that we've got means that we can build the components, the major components of the plant offshore and we can bring them in, and the idea is to bring them in in container-sized components and bring them up on trucks, up onto site, and then bolt them together. And I quite often use the analogy of a Meccano set. The trouble is that there are a lot of people, probably in the audience, who don't know what a Meccano set is. <laughs> Us of a certain vintage will remember this was a great little thing that kids used to get with precursor to, to Lego. Lots of little metal components that you could put together with bolts and things like that. So it's a bit like that. It's a giant Meccano set that we can put together by building offshore. We can drop the cost quite substantially and we do end up with an overall project cost that's manageable because it's staged and also it means that we will de-risk all of that front end as we go forward. So what are these things? What are, what are, you know, I don't, probably don't really need to talk much more about, about the rarers. You've heard a fair bit about that. Um, I will mention, and I was in the US about three weeks ago, um, a lot of new metal alloys using rare earths, really starting to hit the, hit the, the tables over there. Lots of R&D, lots of patents coming out, and I think we'll see a lot more new applications for rare earth materials coming forward in the next 10 years. Zirconium, and this is zirconium in distinction from zircon. We're not talking about zircon here. We're talking about downstream zirconium products. Auto catalyst, your car exhaust system uses a zirconia ceramic. Thermal barrier coatings for turbines, jet and industrial aircraft. These are things that are supposed to help your jet aircraft fly through a volcanic dust cloud and not fall out of the sky, quite valuable. And then right the way through things like paint dryers, paper coating, jewellery, heard of cubic zirconia, this is where it comes from. But the ones that are going to be very interesting are the super alloys coming out again. We're seeing a lot more development in super alloys. Hafnium. Um, my favourite subject. Hafnium, probably the original big demand for hafnium was in nuclear reactors. So in other words, 
Zirconium metal is the tubing that keeps the, the fuel in place in the reactor. It's the only metal that can withstand the heat and the neutron bombardment, but it also allows neutrons to pass through it. Hafnium, on the other hand, can withstand the heat, etc., but it absorbs neutrons, so hence hafnium is used in control rods. So you see the two going hand in hand, but as we know, the nuclear industry has taken a bit of a battering in the last sort of 10 years or so. So there are more other interesting demands on hafnium, super alloys, turbines, jet turbines, for example. 2% hafnium in a uh, nickel cobalt alloy in, a, in an engine turbine raises its operating temperature from 1500, 1400 C, 1500 C, up to 2000 degrees centigrade. So you've got an operating temperature advantage, fuel efficiencies, less, less uh, emissions going forward. So there's a big demand in, in super alloys. The ones that are probably the most fascinating are these things here called ferroelectric. And it uses the characteristics of hafnium oxide to be converted into microprocessors or data storage systems. And uh, in Europe and North America, people talk about this all the time. They talk about hafnium oxide replacing silicon chips in computers. People say to me, what does that mean in consumption? The short answer is I have absolutely no idea, but it all sounds good. Um, and the other one's thermoelectric devices, the thing at the very bottom there. Hafnium oxide has an interesting capacity where it can absorb heat and turn into electricity. And we're actually talking to one US manufacturer. He's talking about using it for tiles on houses, roof tiles. So you can actually t tile your roof of your house and that roof will become something that will generate electricity. It may do away with solar cells. Again, don't ask me how long that's going to get commercialised or how much will be used. But I, I put it in the category of these are really interesting things that are going on in the Hafnia market. And then to finish off, niobium, again, special alloys. It's used in a lot of special high temperature alloys, but mainly in, uh, in steel, special steels, to keep the tensile strength of the steel while lightening it. So in other words, you can lighten steel by up to 10% by putting in a few dollars worth of, of uh, ferro-niobium. So pricing, again, both Dudley and Richard talked about this. I've just got a few graphs at the top. You can see the, uh, the PRND price, the mishmetal price, how it changed about midway through this year. It's come off a little bit. Um, same with the, uh, the oxide prices. And down the bottom for comparison is the zirconium price, the zirconium product price. And it's going through the same phase of adjustment that the rare earth industry is going through. The demand is increasing. The Chinese government, and by the way, 90% of the world's zirconium chemicals all come out of China. Uh, the Chinese government are cutting down on the environmental aspects of these plants. They're, they're, some of these zirconium processing plants are very ordinary. They're on a par with, with rare earths being very ordinary. So finally, Chinese government are starting to crack down, so we're starting to see the prices kick on and going up. And that takes us to, my, again, one of my favourite graphs, this is price sustainability, and we market this very strongly when we're in Europe, North America, Japan, Korea, about what we mean by sustainability. So the, the, the peak, the Mount Everest peak, you can see there back in 2011, the so-called 2011 boom, that did immense damage to the rare earth industry, the credibility of the rare earth industry. We lost a huge amount of investor support Fund managers refused to talk to us. Brokers refused to talk to us because rare earths just became a dirty name. Even though the, the industry, the business, kept going forward and with, with reasonable growth rates, it just got a bad name. And that resulted in that graph just tailing off, tailing off, tailing off to the last 12 months or so where we, we really did flatline. I mean, we were along the bottom. And as I said before, jokingly, I mean, the Chinese companies couldn't make money at those prices. Uh, and that's, you know, that becomes pretty serious when the Chinese are not making any money. So suddenly, this year, we've seen that jump. And the jump puts us in that mid-range between $60 and $100, $110 a kilo for MDPR metal. And that's what we call the sustainability window. Now, there, there are people that will argue with us. We were in Hong Kong last week at a conference. We presented that. Probably got speckled, carried away and tarred and feathered afterwards. But... You've got to be realistic. And when you talk to end users and consumers, you start saying that price is going to go $150. They'll straight away say, damn it, we'll use ferrite. We'll just use ferrite magnets. We can't afford to use those. Or we'll put something else or we'll go back to samarium cobalt magnets. So, you know, we're, we're in the delicate position where we have to be sensible 
about what we think the prices will be going forward. And for Dubbo, so you know, we are a polymetallic project and that's what, what we say gives us a great advantage with that enormous distribution of revenue split. So up the top right, you can see the magnet metals, NDPR, etc. It's about 25% of our total revenue. The other rare earths, including yttrium, only about 5%. You know, it's gadolinium, lutetium and those sorts of things. Niobium about 70%, 17%, hafnium about 10 and zirconium about 42 So looking at the stages, the stage one, that generates that $460 million, $500 million capital cost, generates around $100, $120 million a year cash flow. By the time we go to stage two and up to full production, we're generating in the range of 220 to 250 million years, uh, year, dollars a year cash flow. So it's a substantial project. I said it's reserves. We've, you know, reserves have been allocated only for 20 years based on the financial model, but we do have resources that can take us out to, to year 80 or more. And I threw this in, um, not because I like it, <laughs> but because it's the sort of thing that we see. This came out of UBS and another group called the Visual Capitalist, trying to talk about what will be the incremental commodity demand for 100% EVs. Now, nobody I know believes that we'll get to 100% EVs in the next 20 or 30 years. There's a lot of rhetoric about it, but the practicality and the practicality of setting up the infrastructure to do it is, is virtually impossible. However, it's interesting to look. You know, in lithium, you can see lithium cobalt, what I did like is it showed where the rare earths do fit into the EV thing. It's a, it's a substantial growth in demand for rare earths. And Richard already alluded to that before. So unfortunately, what we see quite often in this industry is spurious representation of people's interpretation of where things are going. And it's just, uh, it's a bit frustrating at times. So where's the project? Where are we at? Okay, so we're completing that modularised study right at this moment. It'll go into a BFS. The CAPEX split I've already talked about. Our pilot plant, you can see the hafnium recovery circuit just there at Ansto. Um, we are in the process of producing from our last and final pilot plant run our nuclear grade zirconium oxide at 99.9 .9, and a hafnium oxide pr product at 99.5, which can go straight into a lot of those downstream applications. I talked about the ferroelectric and the thermoelectric applications. We, did, we do have a, a joint venture with a company called VTRE in Vietnam who have a 4,000 tonne a year rare earth separation plant. We have an option to go forward with them. So uh, early this year we bought 80 tonnes of, of uh, rare earth carbonate in the marketplace as part of our due diligence to run it through that plant, check out their cost structure, check out their management processes and currently we've got 50 tonnes of rare earth material which we're looking to sell elsewhere, other, other interested parties around the world. Continuing to work with Sumitomo, and we're still planning to have commercial production in, in 2020. Uh, thank you. I think I've done that time. But what I do want to finish off with is I, that's the, that's the uh, resource reserve number. Thank you very much.